E for welcoming me to the virtual prayer ministry at five. It is such an honor to congregate with the people of the Lord at such an early hour as we seek the face of the Lord in prayer. This morning, my brothers and sisters, would like to thank the Lord once again for this opportunity of worshiping together. And as Spindley has said yesterday, we were looking at the former reign from a historical perspective. What happened when Jesus Christ uh, promised his disciples the outpouring of the former reign? However, one disappointing uh, fact we saw yesterday is that the disciples were still waiting for the uh, establishment of an earthly kingdom. And for Jesus Christ to correct that particular thinking, he told them that it's not about the earthly kingdom. It's about the visitation of the spirit and how the disciples are going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto all the ends of the earth. And when they got that particular understanding and uh, they waited in prayer and the outpouring came, the results were uh, glorious. And that's what we read from the writings of Mrs. White, that the results were glorious. And there were repentance and confession and the people were benevolent and there was gospel explosion. And the people came together in unusual form of community, their level of fellowship was just amazing. This morning, we're going to look at the latter rain, the promise. So we want to look at the promise of the latter rain and see what the Lord has revealed unto us through the scriptures, but also through the writings of Mrs. White. This morning, I want us to begin by reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 9 to 13. The Bible says, so I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to he who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, your Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? May the Lord bless the reading of His word, and to Him be glory, honor forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, we would like to thank you for such opportunity of coming together to worship you, and at the same time to seek your face in the sweet communion of prayer. And this morning, as I speak your word and your children are going to seek your face in prayer, I pray, loving Father, that you will pour unto us your spirit. Make yourself divinely present through the person of your spirit. Let him abide with us and guide us in each and every activity of the day so that, Father, we are guided from on high. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, among many discourses and teachings which Jesus Christ uh, taught or made when he was here on earth, one of it, I call it the prayer discourse. <clears throat> In the prayer discourse, we find that the different gospel writers have put it in different ways. But if I compare Matthew and Luke, that is if you read Matthew chapter 7 from verse 7, you're going to find that 
In the discourse in the gospel of Matthew, when Matthew talks about fathers knowing how to give gifts to their children, Matthew kind of generalized to say, if we ask the father, just as uh, children ask their earthly fathers, the fathers are going to give their children what they ask. But in the gospel, according to Luke, Luke narrows down the idea. And Luke actually says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we find that Luke is narrow, narrowing it down that if we ask the father, and what should we ask for? If we ask the father for the Holy Spirit, Luke challenges us that will he, the father, not give us the Holy Spirit when we ask him. Now, Luke moves away from asking about general things that are there in life. Luke narrows down. And as I was thinking and meditating this morning, I was like, Okay, it looks like Luke is intentional about it because Luke continues with the idea even in the Acts of the Apostles when he begins to break it down. I remember when I was doing high school, more especially matric high school and we're doing Bible knowledge. And one of the themes which came out very clearly when I was in school is that the power of the Holy Spirit is irresistible. So teachers would give us different scenarios and the teachers would ask us to extract themes in different passages and I remember that one of the themes I wouldn't miss is how Luke has shown that the power of the Holy Spirit is irresistible. So Luke has given us a hint that among many things we may ask let us learn to ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you, my brothers and sisters, that the end of all things is a spiritual. The work which began with the Holy Spirit in the form of the former rain or the early rain will also end with the same Holy Spirit. He is going to help us to conclude this work and we need the Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us on how this is going to end. I'm going to repeat myself. The work which began with the manifestation, powerful manifestation of the spirit is also going to end in the same manner. It's going, it is going to end with the spirit of the Lord being outpoured onto his children and a number of good things are going to happen. So we already read in uh, Zechariah chapter 10, uh, verse 1, and Zechariah at the time when the children of Israel were rebuilding Jerusalem, at a time when the thought Yahweh has remembered them, Zechariah comes with his name, Zachar, Yah, Yahweh has remembered. Yahweh has remembered his people. And Zechariah tells the people, ask ye of the Lord, Rain in the time of the latter rain. Zechariah is also very specific. So he says, Ask ye of the of the Lord rain. What time should we ask uh, for the rain? We should ask for the rain in the time of the latter rain. I want us to take note of that. And when is the time of the latter rain? I'm going to say it again and again this week. This is the time for us to ask the Lord of the rain and we need to ask him. This is the time to uh, trouble the Lord. This is the time for us to trace uh, towards the goal by asking the Lord about the latter rain and the scriptures say so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Blessed be the Lord because he has given us a hint and Luke also says ask the Lord of the Holy Spirit and Zechariah says, ask ye of the Lord rain. But when should we ask uh, for the rain? We should ask in the time of the latter rain. 
Now, the promise of the latter rain is one of the uh, amazing promises I have uh, uh, read and scoured in the writings of Mrs. White in Testimonies to Ministers, page 506, she says, and I quote, the latter rain ripening F's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. I want us to take note of that, that the latter rain, which is the which was which is going to rip in the earth's harvest, it is actually representing the spiritual grace. And I want us to take note spiritual grace, special grace that prepares the church for the second advent of the Son of Man. And I'm going to show you wonderful hints this morning, and I'm so excited, my brothers and sisters. And she continues to say, but unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Here is also another hint. It doesn't mean that simply because we need the latter rain, then we don't need the early rain. Just as the church needed the former rain, the arid rain, we also need the former rain if we are to do well in the time of the latter rain. Meaning to say the repentance and the confessions which they needed at the time of the early church, we need that also. The spirit of benevolence that manifested when the spirit of the Lord was poured upon them, we need such spirit of benevolence if we are to do God's work now. If they needed that gospel explosion, my brothers and my sisters, we need the gospel explosion at this particular point in time. I have heard many beginning to lose the the zeal in evangelism simply because it looks like our traditional methods of doing evangelism are no longer working. Yes, that's the time we need the Holy Spirit that the Lord will give us the courage to approach the people in various ways so that the gospel can still get to so many homes and to so many hearts that we are locked out of uh, the hearing of the gospel. So Mrs. White tells us that if they needed it that particular time, we need the early rain now, and the latter rain will not do its work unless the former rain has fallen. So unless the early showers have done their work, Mrs. White says, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. My brothers and sisters, I want us to see how these two work. The early rain which brought about the repentance and confession, the Eden which brought the gospel explosion, the spirit of benevolence, and that particular spirit of community, and that their supremacy, and that all their divisions disappeared. We need all that now if the latter rain is going to do its work at our time, if the outpouring of the end of the time is going to do its work. And I want us to see what is in the promise of the latter rain. Very quickly, let's look at what is in the promise of the latter rain. From Testimonies, Volume 8, uh, verse, I mean, uh, page 21, Sister White says that the latter rain shall be immeasurable. She says the outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain and glorious was the result. We remember how it was. I mean, Peter preached the first sermon after the outpouring, boom, 3,000 were converted in a day. Just imagine if that can happen now. But we are told, she continues, but the latter rain will be more abundant. I want us to take note of that. And many times when I try to put my mind on it, try to think if the latter rain is going to be more abandoned, then I'm afraid of what is happening in the church at the moment. Because if at Pentecost, Peter would preach a sermon and 3,000 would be converted in a day, and we are told that the latter rain is going to be abandoned. I failed to get my head around it. Meaning to say, if that is the case, then nothing has yet begun. And what is going to happen, my brothers and sisters, is going to be 
something that is going to blow our minds because what the spirit of the Lord is going to do at the end of the time and in our time, I dare say so, in our time would just be amazing and out of this world. It will be heavenly and the Lord is going to do wonderful things. And as the sister prayed that we need to pray that we'll be part of that particular movement. The movement that is going to be moved by the outpouring of the latter rain. Secondly, the, uh, the latter rain is going to be Advent. What am I trying to say? In Acts of the Apostles, uh, page 55, Sister White says, and I quote, near the close of F's harvest, a bes special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. That's why I have put a caption there to say this, the, the latter rain is going to be Advent. In other words, there is nothing like be having the prowess having the zeal to prepare for the second coming of man. It is the spirit of the Lord that will prepare the church for the coming of the son of man. And let me remind you, my brothers and sisters, that even our very repentance is given to us by the spirit of the Lord. Acts chapter 7, verse 30 and 31, uh, look there, wrote to say, uh, 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 that the spirit of the Lord was given to Israel so that it may give repentance to Israel. Repentance is given to us and even our very preparation for the son, for the coming of the Son of Man, it is going to be given to us in the manifestation of the latter rain. The latter rain will be the tool the Lord has put in place to help us prepare for the second, for the coming of the Son of Man. We do not know how to pray. We do not know how we can come to the Lord. We do not also know how we can prepare for the advent. But lo and behold, the spirit who grows for us, the same spirit will prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. So the latter rain is immeasurable. It will be abundant. Secondly, the latter rain is Advent. Point number three, the latter rain is revivalistic. What am I trying to say? Mrs. White in the Great Controversy, page 464, she says, and I quote, before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness. I need to rush so that I can explain the words revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children, end quote. So we are told that when the latter rain is poured, there shall be revival, but it shall not just be revival. She says it will be a revival of primitive godliness. I see a revival of modern godliness, and I don't want to go there. She says a primitive, primitive, a revival of primitive godliness. Let me just go to the final point so that I can explain a little more on a revival of primitive godliness. Finally, Mrs. White also says that uh, the latter rain is eschatological, meaning to say it will come at the end of the time. Great Controversy, page 611, she says, and I quote, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost, as the former rain was given in the outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, that is the seed of the gospel. So the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the gospel. So the latter rain is eschatological. So this morning I have given you four important points. I have said the latter rain is immeasurable, the latter rain is advent, the latter rain is revivalistic to bring about revival, and it is eschatological. In the next few minutes, as I am about to close, let me just give you few hints about a revival of primitive godliness. What is she trying to say? What is primitive godliness? Quickly, let me give you points from the scriptures that are showing us the principles of primitive godliness. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, you're going to find that their primitive godliness was described by devotion to the teachings of Jesus Christ 
and the apostles. So we find that the early church was deeply committed to the teachings of Jesus Christ, but also the apostles. Wherever they went, they preached our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, his very resurrection, his very life, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And that was the blueprint of salvation. My brothers and my sisters, princip principles of primitive godliness cause us to preach Jesus Christ's life causes to preach his very experience, causes to preach his resurrection, causes to preach his very death, and how his life, his death, and his ascension are the blueprint of the gospel that we must preach. If we cannot preach this, my brothers and my sisters, our message is going to be hard to be received by the people. The second principle of primitive godliness is community and fellowship. The early Christian communities we are characterized by strong, strong communal bonds. How do we know it? Acts chapter 2, from verse 42 to 47, we are told that they were regularly gathered for prayer, for worship, and the breaking of bread, sharing their resources and supporting each other. What we are doing now, coming together in prayer, in worship, is one of the principles of primitive godliness. Principle number three of primitive godliness is that of holiness and moral purity. Primitive godliness involved a high standard of moral conduct. Those brothers and sisters were not being dragged about by a life of sin. They were a holy people. They were morally pure. And this is one of the most important principles of primitive godliness. Principle number four of primitive godliness is evangelism and mission. The early Christians were passionate about spreading the gospel. They believed in the importance of evangelism and often at great personal risk, take note of that, to share the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Principle number five of primitive godliness is prayer and the dependence on the Holy Spirit. So prayer was central to the life of the early church. Believers depended on the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit for wisdom, for strength, and for direction. If we need wisdom, if we need strength, if we need direction in as far as our mission is concerned, God's church in Southern Africa, God's church in Africa, God's church in Europe, in America, we need the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Without him, we would just be beating about the bush, we'll simply be fumbling, we'll simply be doing trial and error, we'll simply be moving from one initiative to another, but we'll not be doing anything. We need the Holy Spirit if we need wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit if we need strength. We need the Holy Spirit if we need direction. So what are the practices that reflect primitive godliness? Very quickly, the first practice that reflect primitive godliness is regular worship and sacraments. When you talk of regular worship, we're talking about coming regularly, worship becoming a regular part of our life because worship was a regular part of the early Christian life. Often it included the reading of scriptures, singing of hymns, prayer, and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And mind you, when you talk of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, these brothers and sisters, they were having it regularly, not even quarterly. That's why the Bible in Acts chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, it says, as often as you eat, what does it mean? It means that the Holy Communion is experiential. The Holy Communion is habitual as often as we eat of this bread. We proclaim his death until he comes. And I usually say that the Holy Communion is Advent because we preach it. We preach his death until he comes. The Holy Communion is experiential as often as we eat. It is also evangelistic because when we eat of it, we proclaim his death until he comes. So the first practice of primitive godliness is regular worship and sacraments. Secondly, almsgiving and social justice. Charity 
and care for the poor were important aspects of primitive Christian practice. Ella Christians were known for generosity and efforts to address social injustices. You remember they even said our brothers are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We need not to ignore them. So almsgiving and social justice is one of the practices that reflect primitive godliness. The, the third thing, the third practice is simple living. Those brothers and sisters were just so simple. The early Christians were, you know, often practice simplicity, avoiding excesses and focusing on the spiritual rather than the material. It doesn't mean that we don't need the material, but when it becomes everything, my brothers and sisters, then we lose focus. This includes communal living and sharing positions at such a point in need as we are drawing close to the end of the time. Let's remember those that are in need. And the last point, which is the practice reflecting primitive godliness is persecution and martyrdom. The LA Christian church frequently faced persecution. The steadfastness and faith of Christians in the faith of suffering and martyrdom were seen as a testament over their genuine and commitment to Christ. My brothers and sisters, we need not fear the persecution that will come now and that will come at that particular point in time. These are some of the characteristics or the practices that reflect primitive godliness. And I dare say that our heart's desire should still be that song of that flame of living fire. Remember, Lord, the ancient of days, renew thy work, restore thy grace, and while to thee our hearts we raise, on us the spirit pour, so that there can be that particular revival of primitive godliness. Thank you so much for being there, and may the Lord be with you as you press towards the throne and ask the Lord of the rain in the time of the, of the latter rain. Ask the Lord of his spirit to be poured upon us. Let me pray with you as I close. Loving Father, thank you so much for challenging us once again that our focus, our specific focus, should be to ask you, Father, of the Holy Spirit. And you have promised us that whatever we shall ask you, Father, you, we shall, you shall give us. Your church may be dropping in darkness. Your church may be fumbling left and right, back and forth, simply because, Father, we haven't asked you of the right thing at the right time, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now that we have seen it, we have heard it, and that we, you are calling upon us to experience it, give it to us, loving Father so that you can direct us by giving us wisdom, strength, and direction in as far as this mission is concerned. May you bless us and be with us, Father, as we ask for more of the things that we have to ask you today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.